welcome you all to the next 100 years of your lives and a look into part of the 16 years of mine. So my birthday did pass. <laughs> right now, in terms of human progress, we're here. But what if I were to tell you that we're living in one of the most extraordinary times of human history? Imagine taking a time machine back to 1750, back when the world was in a permanent power outage. You got from place to place on horses, and the only form of long-term communication, wait for it, was just screaming super loudly. The 21st century is exponentially different from that of the 19th and 17th centuries, to the point where the amount of progress that happened today is so different from what life was like back then. And this is just going to continue to grow. The world is expanding and advancing at an exponential rate. And the really exciting part is we're right at the inflection point. I can't wait for the future. So when we take a look at where we are today, things have changed immensely. We're at a whole new level of connectivity, creativity, convenience, and knowledge with so many things being available right at our fingertips. This is actually going to make, and emerging technologies like artificial intelligence and quantum computing will make things like the iPhone and the internet look just like gentle ripples on an ocean of history. Growing up, I was always a super curious person. I asked so many questions, and I was trying to get a better understanding of how the world worked around me and why things were the way they were. In terms of my level of questions, it was definitely a little above the lot of people around me. But there was one specific moment in my life when this definitely spiked. In grade four, I was traveling to India, and I met a girl named Krishna at my grandmother's house. She came every single day, and I'd play with her for the entire two months of summer. But it was one day that I asked her a question, and I want to tell you that Krishna was one of the smartest people I've ever met in my life, and her intellectual horsepower was insane. She was constantly making connections with different things and ideating new creations and inventions that she thought could really help people. I asked her what grade she was in, and the answer that I got was shocking. I had so many emotions just boiling up through my mind, and I actually had no idea how to deal with that. She told me that she had to drop out of school a year ago because she had to support her family and her friend financially. She was working as a maid every single day, and it just didn't seem fair to me that I just won the lottery having been born in North America while there were just billions of other people like her who were stuck in the poverty cycle and didn't have access to food, sanitation, and shelter. It wasn't fair. What I realized is my potential, although we had the same amount, in terms of the amount that was actually mined, hers was exponentially less. I started getting questions popping into my mind about why does the world work this way? And more and more, to the point where I really didn't understand. I came to a realization that so much change was happening around the world, but the problem was that all of this change wasn't being distributed equally. Last year, I had a chance encounter at my friend's house with her visually impaired grandmother. She was bumping into a ton of things when trying to get around the house, and I had the opportunity to sit down and chat with her, and she's one of the most amazing women I've ever met. She was telling me that she was using a device called the white cane, which had happened to be a stick that had never been updated to take advantage of technology. I continued the conversation with her, and she was telling me that it was only able to detect ground-level obstacles and nothing above the ground from knee to head level, and because of that, it caused a lot of injuries to occur. Now, I went in my community and reached out to a lot of my friends who had low vision as well, and they were voicing a lot of the same concerns. And being a person that was so passionate about coding and circuitry, building things and taking them apart, putting them back together again, it was just baffling to me that nobody had innovated on something so traditional, because not a, a lot of people were aware about this problem. But it inspired me to create a solution. And that's where my startup company, Smart Cane, was born. Smart Cane is basically building an enhanced version of the white cane with technology. 
It's embedded with object detection capabilities to detect obstacles in front of a person from knee to head level to prevent injuries from occurring. GPS navigation through haptic feedback, so let's say if you had to turn left, it would vibrate once, and then turn right, it would vibrate twice to help make it easier to get place to place. And also computer vision, which is a subset of artificial intelligence so that when you point your phone camera at different things, it can actually describe to you what they are through audio output. I've learned so much throughout this journey, and from just, um, thank you. I've learned so much throughout this journey, and from just starting out as an idea, I knew that I wanted to take it forward from there. And there's a saying in the accessibility community that says nothing for us without us, so I made sure along the way to constantly reach out to people, find what different problems were within the current white cane and other accessibility products to see how we can actually improve that and leverage technology to solve those. Starting out as just an idea, we got on to develop an amazing team of four people, have raised about $83,000 in funding and in-kind services, and got some support from some incredible companies like Aero Electronics, Inertia Engineering, and Microsoft, and have also developed our MVP, so not most valuable player, but it's a minimum viable product to get it ready for a pilot project in the coming months. But a question popped into my head, and it was, how can we actually get more change like this happening around the world? Because it wasn't just the accessibility community being left behind. There are so many different groups around the world that we really need to start thinking about. But the only way that we're going to achieve substantial progress on some of the most challenging problems of our time is to get some more smart people, like every single person in this room, to start driving the solutions. But a big barrier that's stopping people from actually developing solutions to a lot of important social problems is the notion and belief that you can either get a return on investment or a return on humanity. But what's really important is a ton of social problems and important problems around the world have a tremendous economic incentive tied to it. So that is incredible. But if we actually want to get a better understanding of issues happening around the world, we have to go beyond the bubble that we live in. We're so fortunate to have grown up and living in a country like Canada, but there are a lot of other things happening around the world that we really need to start exploring. So I encourage all of you to push past your comfort zones, put yourself in uncomfortable situations, and be open. Learn about different cultures, learn about problems happening around the world. Things like cost of living, access to healthcare and quality education, and the food crisis. By 2030, the world's population is going to increase to 9 billion people, and we won't have enough food to sustain that. This is literally an incredible problem that's going to impact all of humanity, but not a lot of people are working on it, and it's insane to me because this is gonna happen in almost 10 years. But although these seem daunting, the good thing is, so many emerging technologies are going to serve as tools that can actually help us solve these today. So what are the next 100 years going to look like? Things like artificial intelligence, quantum computing, and virtual reality can all help us do this. So I encourage everyone to start thinking about this and create solutions to problems that matter. And I also want to specify that you never have an AI company or a quantum computing company or a virtual reality company. Instead, you're using AI, quantum computing, and virtual reality to solve a meaningful problem. So it's also really important to start being proactive versus reactive. Instead of waiting for these problems to occur and for these crises to increase in intensity, how can we start tackling it today? but also changing the framework of our thinking. Instead of treating diseases after they occur, what if we can prevent them from happening in the first place? And I'm really excited to talk to you guys about a lot of emerging technologies coming out today. Artificial intelligence is changing the world at a breakneck speed. Some things like self-driving cars are actually gonna be here within the next decade, which a lot of you probably already know. But what about thinking beyond that? Self-flying cars, which a lot of you may not know, people are already testing out today to release commercially within the next five years. Imagine taking a vehicle that could travel at light speed to go anywhere on the planet. So you can actually commute to work in Toronto while actually living in Hawaii, which is pretty cool. Or even for the long weekend, you can take a trip to Mars. But also, 
artificial intelligence has so much more potential from this. Things like generative design and also data analytics, predicting diseases before we get them in the first place, and artificial general intelligence. But instead of just plagiarizing the human brain and emulating it, machines may even at a point become to surpass human abilities. And this is a really insane reality to think about. But talking about the human brain, when we think about some of the smartest minds on the planet, we often think about these two names, Albert Einstein and Sir Isaac Newton. But a deeper implication for this is, this was hundreds of years ago. The human brain hasn't actually advanced in centuries. Although technologies and the advancement rate of that has been exponential, this development on this front has been quite stagnant. But how can we bring our brain to the 21st century? And this is where something called brain-computer interface comes in. It's literally allowing us to leverage the electrical activity in our brain to control things like computer programs and machines with our minds. We can start being able to control robotic body parts to help with prosthetics, and even augment a lot of human capabilities, both intellectually and physically. But going beyond just human to machine interface, what about human to human? Being able to communicate with each other telepathically, I think that would be really cool. Or even human to the internet. Now we can start downloading skills and knowledge and even get to experience another person's life. This probably seems like something coming out of the matrix, but a lot of companies are working on this today. Elon Musk startup, Neuralink, Facebook, and Google. It's a very exciting reality that's not science fiction. But all of this pales in comparison to what's to come. The ability to control and program our own biology. With genomics, we can now leverage our genome sequences and use things like deep learning, which is, again, another subset of artificial intelligence, to not only predict diseases, but eradicate a lot of diseases within our genetic makeup. And beyond that, we can even augment our human capabilities once again to an unimaginable extent and develop designer babies, which is also a very scary reality, and there has to be a lot of things developed in order to be prepared for that. But I really want to focus on the ability to stop disease from happening in the first place. And a problem and project that I developed to help address this and help accelerate the progress on this front is basically developing a DAP, which is on the blockchain, to help people upload their genome sequencing data to help researchers get access to this, to help them get an unbiased version of this data that's not skewed so they can start implementing more algorithms to help with data science so then they can identify patterns. But something that's super exciting to me is human longevity. It's really, really cool. So I want you all to close your eyes and imagine living like you're 20 until you're 80 or 90. This is amazing. But going beyond that, we can actually reduce the amount of senescent cells in our bodies, produce more shelter in, in order to not only increase our health spans, but increase our lifespans to live until we're 150 or 200. So I'm really excited. Maybe I won't die at 90 years old. Maybe it'll be 150. We'll never know in the short term. But this is a future that I'm super looking forward to. But this and whatever I just explained to you is not even stepping our toes into the water. You see, in the 1990s, the internet was going to be the next big thing. But we're at a really interesting turning point in history where there isn't just one next big thing anymore. There are so many. Whether it's an AI or quantum computing, nanotechnology, biotech, all these technologies are not entities on our own, but instead they're tools that we can use to solve some of the most important problems of our time. But all of this is just words until we just do something about it. Because the future is just a vision until we all work together to create it. It's really important to start getting more smart people working on some of the most pressing issues of our time. Although these problems may seem daunting, every single problem is an opportunity, and your age doesn't matter. Whether you're old or you're young, that's okay, because age is literally just a number. Instead, it's your willingness to put in the work, your willingness to learn, your curiosity, your passion, your grit, and most importantly, your willingness to fail and learn from your failures that'll help you be successful. So if any of you have an idea, my advice is to go for it. 
because the worst case scenario is always that you learn something. But another thing that I also wanted to touch on is amazing innovators like Elon Musk, Steve Jobs, Peter Thiel, and Jeff Bezos. They are incredible people that developed unicorn companies that are impacting billions. But when they were younger, around my age, nobody really told them that they would be the CEOs of the next billion dollar company. They had super unique experiences and were put in serendipitous situations and had a unique mindset that helped them execute on super ambitious ideas. But what I wanted to point out is that none of these skills that they had came innately. All of these skills can be developed regardless of what age you're at. So in order to take an unconventional path or in order to achieve unconventional success, you need to start taking an unconventional path to do so. So zig when everyone else is zagging. It's time to flip our thinking. It's time to start putting forth more innovative ideas, capital, resources, and most importantly, human resources to compile all of our knowledge and work together collaboratively to solve some of the most important problems of our time. And when we do that, that is when we can achieve disruption. Let's start building the future that we want to live in today. Thank you.